Our guests are authors Andrew and Leslie Coburn, and their book is titled Dangerous Liaison, the inside story of the U.S.-Israeli covert relationship. The Coburns trace the association between the U.S. Central Intelligence Agency and the Israeli Intelligence Network from the founding of the State of Israel four decades ago through the recent war in the Middle East. Andrew Coburn, co-author of the book Dangerous Liaison, the inside story of the U.S.-Israeli covert relationship. What's the premise of your book? The premise is that there's a side to the relationship between the U.S. and Israel which goes much beyond just the sort of sentimental links and the links forged by supporters of Israel in this country. What we say, what we explain is that there has been since the, almost the earliest days of the Israeli state and these earliest days of the CIA a secret bond, a secret link between them basically by which the Israelis, Israeli intelligence, did jobs for the CIA and for the rest of American intelligence. And this, you cannot understand what's been going on around the world with American covert operations and indeed Israeli covert operations until you understand that the two countries have this secret arrangement. Leslie Coburn, what was the most interesting part of writing this book? Well, I mean, there are a number of things. Um, for example, uh, one particular part which I found most interesting was we talk about Israeli operations in Colombia and um, <clears throat> some of the Israeli commandos who trained the hit squads of the Medellin cartel. It turns out that they had trained us in Israel as well and uh, when they were between trips to Colombia. These were the same people who also uh, trained most of the top commanders in the Guatemalan military, also trained the Leslie Coburn, what was the most interesting part of writing this book? Well, I mean, there are a number of things. Um, for example, uh, one particular part which I found most interesting was we talk about Israeli operations in Colombia. And um, <clears throat> some of the Israeli commandos who trained the hit squads of the Medellin cartel, it turns out that they had trained us in Israel as well and uh, when they were between trips to Colombia. These were the same people who also uh, trained most of the top commanders in the Guatemalan military, also trained the Contras. And uh, they were working, they had a firm that was under license to the Israeli Ministry of Defense. Um, and then they turn up in the jungles of uh, Puerto Boyacá in Colombia. So, I mean, we had a lot of adventures, I must say. Did the Israelis cooperate with you at all in this book? Well, we talked to, um, you know, we never made an official approach to the Israeli government or Mossad or anything like that, but we managed to get, in the end, to talk to all the people we wanted to talk to in Israel. Uh, we talked to people like, uh, for instance, David Kimshi, who was, um, had a long Mossad career. He eventually rose to be deputy head of Mossad, the Israeli secret uh, in, uh, intelligence agency, the equivalent of the CIA. And I remember a wonderful uh, evening we had in his home, in his study, um, where he was talking in guarded fashion about his career in intelligence. He then went on to be uh, Deputy uh, Director General of their Foreign Ministry. But I suddenly noticed um, around the walls of his study where we were sitting, it was like a history of Israeli covert operations because, for instance, on one wall there were the most beautiful wood carvings, African wood sculptures. And he said, oh, that lovely, David, uh, where'd you get those? Oh, present from Mobutu, Zaire. Oh, that one's nice, where'd that come from? Uh, Picasso, the Central African Empire. Uh, then another wall, beautiful Persian miniatures. Uh, where they come from? Oh, present from the Shah for something we did for him. So, uh, you know, just there was this man sitting, this master spook, um, surrounded by mementos of his career. And so we, you know, we talked to him. We spent a lot of time talking. Um, as, well, there's a street in Tel Aviv, an avenue called Shaul Hamalek, which is right across the street from what's called the Kirya, which is the Ministry of Defense compound. Uh, it's a huge area in the middle of Tel Aviv. And on the other side of Shal Hamalek are a row of very fancy high-rises, um, which is basically the headquarters of the Isra Israeli military industrial complex. I mean, that area is. So you have offices of all the major arms dealers, the offices of the Israeli representatives of the major American defense corporations. You have Mossad headquarters. Just down one side street, you have a very beautiful building, which is the headquarters of a man called Shal Eisenberg which not many people in the outside world know about, but he's 
certainly the richest and probably the most powerful man in Israel. He's the master arms dealer, uh, is behind a lot of political campaigns, behind a lot of politicians. Again, very much involved in this secret world of arms deals and covert operations that we talk about as the link with America. There were two American names early in the book, Al Schwimmer and Hank Greenspun. Uh, well, Al Schwimmer um, is, again, a fascinating character. Um, he, right at the very birth of Israel, um, his real name is Adolf Schwimmer, but everyone calls him Al, he was basically an arms smuggler for Israel. He was flying in arms during their War of Independence um, uh, from all over the place. Uh, he was originally a TWA flight engineer, in fact, uh, but also a brilliant pilot. So, for example, he was flying arms from uh, Prague because uh, in the early days of Israel, in fact, most of their arms, or the, the one of the most, their most important single arms supplier was the communist government in Czechoslovakia. And Schwimmer was uh, part of that. He went on to found um, Israel aircraft industries. In the meantime, still sort of flying arms, you know, doing covert arms deals around the world. And then years later, um, his energy is still undiminished. He was right at the heart of the Iran Contra business. He was, you know, absolutely central at one point to the uh, covert shipments of arms to Iran. Hank Greenspan was another fascinating guy. He um, he was he was a U.S. Army veteran at the end of World War II, and he was, he'd just moved to Las Vegas to set up a radio station when Al Schwimmer suddenly knocked on the door. He didn't know him. Introduced by a mutual friend, said, "Hey, drop everything. I want you to come with us, and we're going to we're going down to Mexico. We got to we need you to f to go and vet some arms that we've gotten hold of that we're buying illegally. In fact, uh, we need to get to Palestine for the strike." So Schwimmer, uh, so Greenspan says, "Oh, okay." Drops everything and gets, becomes an arms smuggler briefly. Um, he disappears from his house for six months. Comes back, can't tell his wife where he's been, and he's you know been in Mexico bribing officials and. And um, then he goes back to Las Vegas. He later became very famous as the publisher of the Las Vegas Sun, uh, early opponent of Joe McCarthy, Fort Howard Hughes, uh, and was also actually, interesting enough, he was the conduit for many years until the campaign finance laws got tightened up. Um, if uh, candidates, particularly Democratic candidates, who needed cash in a hurry, Hank Greenspan in Las Vegas was the man to see because in Las Vegas, of course, there's a lot of cash around. And if you were in dire straits, uh, for instance, Jimmy Carter was saved at a crucial moment of his candidacy in 1976 um, during the Pennsylvania primary when Hank Greenspan came up with $60,000. So you have characters go all the way through. Yeah, I mean, one point about doing this kind of story about covered operations with U.S. and Israel is that because Israel is such a young country, some of these people who were there at the very beginning who were making the deals in the 50s, are still alive. We went to see uh, Issa Harrell, who was um, uh, really a, you know, a, a towering figure in covert operations. Uh, he was chief of Mossad at a crucial time in the 50s, when the relationship, the, the, this secret relationship we're talking about, was just getting going. Uh, this is a, t you know, it, there was a deal made in 1951. Ben-Gurion came to Washington and offered the CIA, the services of Israeli intelligence. Who was Ben Gurion? Ben Gurion is the father of Israel. He was, yeah, he was prime minister for many years. He really steered the state to independence, uh, steered his, his people to independence, uh, wrote the Israeli Declaration of Inten uh, Independence, was prime minister all the way through with a brief interval um, until 1963. I mean, the Israel you see today is really the creation of David Ben Gurion. Originally from what country? He was originally from, uh, well, from what's now Poland, but was then Russia, part of, I mean, it's, the territory has changed hands. Um, Let me go back to Leslie Coburn and ask her who your favorite character was in your book. Favorite character? Um, Most interesting person. Well, let's see. That's, it's a very tough choice. I mean, as you, you've, you've seen, I mean, there are people like, uh, you even have the, the the original Uzi in the book, uh, the man called Uzi, that Ooh, all Uzis Uzi. are, are, are named after. What's his name? His name is Uzi Gall. And he, he lives in the United States. He lives in Pennsylvania. He, yeah. How, how did he get, how, no, not how did he get his name, how did the name, the Uzi gun, and what was it, what is it? Well, it's... Um, well, it, I, 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 um, 
I spent a lot of time talking to Uzi, well, we both did, but um, he explained to me, actually I'm no engineer, and he explained to me how, you know, what his idea was. Uzi's a guy who thinks about guns a lot, not in any kind of, how can I say, sort of obsessive way. Uh, he's not interested in killing people. I mean, uh, I asked him at one point. You, first of all, where'd you find him? I found him, he didn't really want to be, to, to, he lives in the United States, he didn't, he asked me not to be too specific about where he lives, um, but it's on the East Coast. I found him through other people who were interested in, um, had his, shared his interests, which is, you know, the engineering of guns. I asked him, in fact, after the end of a long conversation, I said, well, you know, you're sort of intimating, well, you know, Uzis have sort of killed a lot of people. Um, I mean, you know, you're very famous for what Uzis do to the human body. And he said, yeah, he said, I read in the paper about, you know, so it's entered the language. People talk about oozying a house. So I expect him then to say, you know, I'm sorry about that. And he said, uh, he said, I don't deserve such fame. He said, I just made a good gun. So he's got pride in his creation. Where was he when he invented the Uzi? And what is it for people who've never seen an Uzi? Well, it's, a, it's an automatic, um, it's basically a submachine gun. Um, the small. It's small. Um, its great virtues are that it's very stable. When you fire it, it doesn't, a lot of these kind of guns, you know, they sort of, the recoil will pull it all over the place. And because of some design features he thought of, um, it's a very, very stable gun. I mean, you can hold it and pull the trigger and it won't sort of jerk around. It's also very reliable, won't jam, it's easy to maintain. Um, and, you know, the basic model he designed in a British jail was where he had the original idea. He's, uh, he was living on a kibbutz. Um, just when the, when the British still um, owned Palestine. And the British came and raided the place for arms, of which they found a lot, and carted Uzi off. And he started to have this idea about, you know, what a really good gun would consist of. And he came out and uh, he actually sort of started to work on the prototype in, the, in this farm, sort of the machine shop where they repaired the tractors. Um, so it's, you know, it's become, then he was, you know, bought by the Israeli army and they decided to name it after him. The American Secret Service use it? The American Secret Service use it. Um, as you point out in the book, I mean, right here in Washington, you've got the Secret Service guarding the president of the White House with Uzis and a few blocks down the street, you've got the dope dealers, you know, guarding their patch and eliminating rivals with Uzis. So it's, it's the universal gun of choice. How did you two meet? We met in, uh, in London years ago. Uh, we met uh, at, a, at a, um, a club called Zanzibar, actually, in London. What were you doing? I was, um, at the time, I was finishing graduate school over there at uh, SOAS, which is the School of Oriental and African Studies. I was also, had just started working at NBC News. Where's home originally? San Francisco. And what is your relationship? Well, uh, we're married, and uh, we work together. We make films together for PBS Frontline, and we write books together. So it's a very close relationship. What other books have you written? Uh, we, this is our first together, but uh, I wrote a book called Out of Control, which was about um, the Reagan administration activities in Central America. It was about covert operations down there. And I wrote a book called The Threat, which was about the Soviet military. Out of Control had what impact? on our body politic? Well, it was interesting because uh, I had actually spent a long time covering Central America, uh, the North operation for CBS News in New York, where I was working at the time. And uh, I broke the story for CBS about the North operation in Central America. So then wrote a book which was basically about our adventures uh, in finding out about this stuff in Honduras, in uh, Washington bars and restaurants in Costa Rica. It got into the seamier side of uh, what was going on down there with operations. Where'd you get your original interest in this kind of a story? Well, I think it, it gelled for me when uh, years ago in London, uh, there's a very famous arms dealer called Sam Cummings who uh, did a lot of work for the CIA. He's one of the biggest private arms dealers in the world. and. Uh, he fascinated me, and what fascinated me was his ability to go into a situation and supply arms in little wars. And uh, he, he had no problem at all with supplying both sides. And that kind of mentality of the, uh, the arms dealer coming in into a little war just got me very fascinated with little wars. I'd also, I'd lived in Africa while I was at Yale. Um, I'd spent a lot of time in the third world even then. 
Can you go back to your early childhood somewhere or your high school or college years and point to someone or some a parent or somebody that said uh, that gave you the kind of boost to get into this kind of work? I don't think so. I think it was a series of things. I think living in Africa when I was a, a student was very helpful. Where'd you live? I was living in a village in uh, Kenya, up in the mountains, a place where they'd never um, seen a white woman before. It was quite an interesting experience. Why were you living there? Um, because I was very adventurous, in fact. I mean, I've done a lot of things like this, and, um, you know, as well as covering Central America, I've I covered the war in Cambodia, the, the, this recent situation. Um, I went to Saudi Arabia during the Gulf War. I was, you know, in Israel under the scuds. This is what I like to do. What do you remember about meeting Leslie? Well, uh, <clears throat> what were you doing? I was, uh, I was <laughs> at this party, <laughs> sitting at the bar. But uh, what I was working at, of course, uh, sorry, uh, just think at the precise moment. And what uh, year? This was 1976. Whew, got that right. Um, <laughs> Uh, what was I doing? I was working for a British um, sort of investigative show called World in Action. Um, in Britain, the, the networks, they, you know, they have a lot of documentaries on television. and It's a much more routine thing. So we used to, uh, it was a weekly show, and we used to, actually it was a wonderful operation. Um, it used to be sent off, and you could basically do almost what you wanted, I mean, provided it was a good story. I think at that time, what was I working on? I was working on a story about how the, the had, there was a huge argument going on then, as, I suppose as now, as to whether you know, nuclear power was safe. And there were these rumors I'd heard that there'd been a nuclear accident in the Soviet Union. And this is long before the days of Glasnost and so forth. That there'd been a nuclear accident in the Soviet Union and that, of, that it was very mysterious, no one knew much about it, but something terrible was supposed to have happened 20 years before. And I set out to dig into this, and I found, actually it was the first sort of contact I had with Israel. I found someone in Israel who was a witness to this accident, who'd somehow been allowed to emigrate, and tracked him down and tracked other people down. I, I just remember a sort of happy time of life, because I met Leslie and also was working on this terrific story. So, uh, Where were you from originally? I was from Ireland. I grew up in Ireland. Uh, my father's Scottish, but... Uh, Where in Ireland? Uh, County Cork, East Cork. And what was life like growing up there, and when did you leave there? Uh, life was interesting. It was like, uh, actually, we didn't have a, in the early years, we didn't have a car or a telephone or a fridge. So I grew up, in a, we you know, went everywhere by horse. Uh, I grew up in a sort of 19th century way. I mean, there was no difference between the way we were living and someone 100 years before. Um, communicated by telegram. It's perfectly, I can tell people who, <laughs> under the age of 110, that it's a um, perfectly viable way to live. Um, I left there, I guess, when I was 17 and uh, went to work in London. Went to school where? I went to school, uh, in the American sense, I went to Oxford. Studied? Uh, studied is probably exaggerating it a bit. <laughs> was listed as studying history. Back to the book. Um, what do you think of the Israeli? What do you think of Israeli people? And what you've learned over the years and being close to them? Well, both of us love working in Israel. Um, I started working in Israel. I've been going back, you know, every year for uh, not not every year, but have made no, numerous trips to Israel since uh, 1980, 1981. Um, Israelis are very interesting people. Also, I mean, fact is. Um, Israelis love to talk and uh, are very, tend to be, at least in, the, in this business, in the arms business and in intelligence, fairly gregarious and also um, they uh, have a lot of feuds with each other, uh, very strong personalities. So it's a, I mean, it's, it's a very interesting group of people to, uh, to work with. Are they tough? Are they effective? Uh, do very you like them? Yes, uh, really. I got to say I do. Um, they're very tough. Um, have an engaging cynicism about them. Um, I did. How could you not like it? For instance, we were talking. To, I mean, this may sound bizarre, but for example, uh, we were talking to an executive. This is some years back. An executive of Israel Aircraft Industries, which is the huge Israeli defense aerospace. It's the biggest business in Israel, in fact, biggest single firm. And um, this was a time when this was the early 80s. There'd been a row, a big argument here in Washington because the United States had wanted to sell F-15 fighters to Saudi Arabia. 
And the Israeli lobby here kicked up a huge fuss saying, you know, you shouldn't be selling these planes, but if you must, you shouldn't sell them with, the, you can't sell them with the, the extra fuel tanks that will enable them to reach Israel and bomb Israel, should the Saudis get that idea. So the Carter administration had agreed that you know, the F-15s would not have the extra fuel tanks. A few years, la few years later, we're talking to um, this gentleman from Israel Aircraft Industry. He said, do you remember those fuel tanks that weren't allowed to go to Saudi Arabia? And we said, yes. And he said, do you remember how that ban got dropped, which it had by that point? I said, yes. He said, do you know where those fuel tanks get made? I said, where? He said, Tel Aviv. We make them. So, I mean, he was delighted. He thought it was a, a great joke and a great sort of you know, business coup that his firm was making the fuel tanks, which would theoretically at least allow Saudi Arabia to bomb Israel. I mean, for example, you have things like, um, we got to know quite well uh, a man who we refer to in the book as the colonel, who is an uh, American intelligence official working in Israel, spying on Israel, spying on the Israelis. And um, of course, the Israelis uh, knew he was doing it. He knew they knew he was doing it. And when he got to the end of his term in Israel, the chief of Israeli military intelligence threw him a big going away party and said, we like you, you're more Israeli than the Israelis, now get out of here and don't come back. So it's, a, it's such an interesting interplay between these people. You tell a story early in the book, um, you know, I've never heard anyone pronounce his full name, so I don't even know if this is right. James Jesus Angleton, or they call him Jesus. What, what, what did he ever... He's always everyone, although it should be Jesus, because that was in recognition of the Mexican half of his family, um, everyone always pronounced it Jesus. You tell an early story about a monument to him near Yad Vashem, the memorial to the Holocaust. Explain that story. Right. Well, um, so if you're going uh, in the, on the outskirts of Jerusalem, on the western side at least, you have Yad Vashem, which is the very moving memorial to the Holocaust. If you take the road past there, out of town, you go down the hill and you wind through a pretty village and eventually come to the, what's called the Jerusalem Forest, which is full of memorial groves, if you like, to, um, to people that, you know, get honored in this way, uh, war heroes or simple people who've been killed in war, or people recognized by the state of Israel. And re we were driving through this one day, and the reason we were doing this was we were looking for the memorial grove, memorial forest to James Jesus Angleton, because Angleton was a CIA man, a senior CIA official, very famous for a number of reasons, but he was of interest to us because he was the link many years between the CIA and the Mossad. And the Israelis had all said to us, his old intelligence friends had said, oh yes, we love Jim, and Jim was a good friend to Israel, and we liked Jim a lot. And in fact, when, so, you know, after he died, which was in 1987, we erected a memorial, you know, created a memorial forest for him. And it's out there, and you know, I suppose it's a bit hard to find. You might not want to look for it, but you know, I can tell you that it's there. So we thought we'd go and take a look. So we drive out, and there are all these nice groves with nice plaques carved in stone to various people. And we can't find the Angleton Memorial. And eventually, we decide to give up. We think we've, take, taken, we've you know, taken a wrong direction or something. So we're looking for a place to turn, and there's an open space, or it looks like an open space, and we drive up. But it isn't. It's, the, it's basically a garbage dump with a few stunted, dying little trees poking up and a plaque actually on plastic screwed to the stone to James Jesus Angleton. So this was the memorial forest. And we felt it's kind of hard to explain, but it's, uh, in a way, it was an Israeli joke. You know, it was, um, look, you know, we're supposed to like you a lot. We're supposed to owe you a lot. But we don't owe anyone anything. So here's what we really think of you, and it's a garbage dump. It's Mr. A, Angleton is dead. He's dead, uh, but not forgotten. Book, a new book just out about him? Yeah, but it doesn't really go into the Israeli side, which is what interests us. I mean, you know, he had, Angleton did a number of things. He was, you know, he's best, he's been most written about because he was head of CIA counterintelligence and was searching for, you know, got obsessed about a Soviet mole in the CIA. But although that may, may be the most publicized role he had, he did other things too. And his most important job, really, and this is the role that the agency has always been very keen to obscure. In fact, they prevented uh, one former colleague of his in the agency from writing a book about him because they said, oh, my God, if he writes that book, he'll talk about this particular job, which was Angleton's role as a liaison with foreign intelligence services. 
including the Israelis, uh, particularly the Israelis, in fact. And this was an absolutely key role. There's a lot of bodies buried there because if what Angleton was able to do, if there was things the CIA couldn't do or didn't want to be seen doing or you know, want to do in this country, which it's legally precluded from doing, Angleton could go to his buddies, as liaison, could go to his buddies in foreign intelligence services and particularly the Israelis and say, help us out. And that, you know, that was, Angleton was really the sort of point man for the connection that we explain in the book. What would happen if all American aid to Israel was stopped and the Israelis had to shut down their arms business? What would happen to that country? It would be a disaster. Why? Because the arms business is the, um, is the engine that drives the economy of Israel. Um, you know, it's the biggest export. Uh, it's, they have to, at this point, it's such a huge part of the economy that they have to continue shipping arms, which is why, one reason why you get a situation where they're shipping all over the world, and particularly, um, you know, unattractive situations like shipping to South Africa. So uh, it's, it's all driven by money, by the desperate need to keep this uh, business going. I mean, people will say to you, well, we had to, we had to uh, go into the arms business in a big way because we wanted to become self-sufficient because of the po there's always the possibility of a next war. But in fact, what's happened, because they're very military aid dependent on the U.S., what's happened is that um, it, they're more and more dependent on American components, on American research and development, and, uh, ha you know, hardly self-sufficient. And also, I mean, there's another element of that, which is the, they have this huge arms industry that they have to keep going, and it's the major provider of employment in the country, uh, especially of well-paying jobs. Their markets, as, sort of were, as wars sort of are tailing off around the world, they, they see as their principal uh, future growth market the Pentagon here. So they're becoming, you know, they're becoming, trying to be, in fact, more dependent or getting more business out of the U.S., out of the U.S. military which certainly does, you know, doesn't make them self-sufficient. If your economy depends on selling stuff to the Pentagon or um, tending that way, you know, then that makes that connection even greater. But there's also, on the intelligence side of things, um, when I say their need for, for this industry, the military industry is desperate, um, you have a whole intelligence branch that was set up called LACAM to get high-tech you know, military technology around the world by any means, and that includes stealing it. So you've had a lot of cases over the years of LACAM operations, uh, including in this country, going around to different companies and getting a hold of the blueprints and carting away boxes uh, to bring back to Tel Aviv because they have to stay ahead of the curve. Do the Israelis lie to the public? Well, uh, you know, there are a number of things in talking about this kind of stuff, covert operations, national security subjects, um, there is censorship in Israel. So a lot of these things can't even be discussed. I mean, we talk about in the book the Israeli nuclear program and break some ground on this. You know, we talk about the Israeli chain of command, that it takes the prime minister, the, uh, the uh, head of Mossad, and the defense minister to, to make the decision to push the button, to push the nuclear button. Is this, is this the nuclear facility at Dimona? That's correct. Is that the only nuclear facility they have? Well, it's an it's a enormous nuclear facility. I mean, but what we've discovered... Did you try to go there? Oh, I've been to Dimona, yes. Inside? No, 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 no. That's very difficult. Where is it? It's down in the Negev. It's out in the middle of nowhere. And what happens is when you go to Dimona, um, if you happen to stop the car, and take a picture of it or film it or whatever, you know, you're, you're out of there very quickly. One um, defense intelligence agency friend of ours said that he had more flat tires in front of Demona than anywhere else in Israel. But, uh, but what we also discovered was um, that Israel not only has nuclear weapons, but sophisticated tactical nuclear weapons, just like we do. Remember, uh, the army used to have, the American army used to have nuclear landmines for example, all over Germany. Well, the Israelis, we've discovered, have nuclear landmines seated on the Golan Heights. And at one point, Ariel Sharon, who is, um, uh, of course, famous for the invasion of, of Lebanon and whatnot, uh, went to Begin and said, look, you're busy, you know, uh, and, and had a terrible relationship at the time with the chief of Mossad. He wanted to take over sole control of the nuclear button. And Begin, fortunately, said no. But this kind of thing, I mean, that's why it's, um, 
the Israelis have gone wild for the book, and they, they've uh, serialized it in Mariv and written about it in Haaretz, because they, they can't talk about this sort of stuff unless it's been printed abroad before. Mariv and Haaretz are what? They're two very large Israeli papers. Haaretz is uh, the kind of New York Times of Israel, and uh, Mariv is the big conservative paper. And you point out in your book that uh, one of the things you did differently with this book is had a lot of translations of a lot of Hebrew in Israeli newspapers. Why? Because um, there's a lot, an amazing amount of information that appears in, in Hebrew. And the Israelis feel comfortable about this because if it's in Hebrew, it's like it's among themselves. Uh, that doesn't get translated into English. I mean, they're very conscious of the feeling that Hebrew is like a code. I mean, not many people outside Israel actually speak it. So, uh, you know, if you can say something in Hebrew, it's almost like saying it in secret. So we discovered that, for instance, the Hebrew press um, in Israel is, ama is a very, very good, you know, there are a lot of very good journalists, there are very good newspapers, um, an amazing amount of information that never finds its way into the dispatches of, you know, correspondents of, you know, foreign correspondents from Israel, very few of whom actually speak Hebrew. Um, and isn't certain, or do, nor does it appear in the English language Israeli papers like the Jerusalem Post. I mean, someone said to us, do um, you know what the function of the Jerusalem Post is? And we said, what? He said, it's to, uh, he said, it's to give, the give the American ambassador a happy breakfast. So, we, uh, so they're very conscious of, you know, Hebrew is for us and English is for everyone else. Um, we also found that, you know, in books and also sort of diaries, documents, there was a sort of treasure trove. I mean, the Israelis, of course, you know, are good at keeping secrets. I mean, are good at, you know, it's not like they spill everything out and they have total freedom of information, but there is still a wealth of detail and information and color and a lot of what you need to know to understand the connection we're talking about in, in Hebrew. How did you get it translated? I mean, was it expensive? Yeah, but we thought it was, you know, it was worth the investment. Can you give us an example of something that you learned that was in Hebrew that we never saw in English? Sure. Um, the 67 War, for example. Um, the, uh, you know, the general people, people's general view of the 1967 war was all the Arabs sort of ganged up on Israel and maybe even attacked Israel and the Israelis fought them off and won the great victory which got them the West Bank that people are arguing about today. In fact, um, I'm give you a quick background, I mean according to, you know, the, these, well, let put it this way, we found um, a book of memoirs written by a guy who was the military aid to the then Prime Minister of Israel, this guy called Israel Yor. And he gives an account in, in, his, in this book, which has never been translated into English, it's available only in Hebrew, in fact wasn't even a sort of bestseller there. He gives an account how on June the 3rd, 1967, two days before the war broke out, he was at the home of the Prime Minister and they were waiting for the head of Mossad to come back from Washington because the head of Mossad had been sent to Washington to get permission, to get the green light to launch the war. And he explains, you know, we knew we could win. He's explained already in the book. He says, we knew we could win. The generals were hot to go. They weren't really scared of the Egyptians or anyone else, uh, but they wanted to go ahead with this. And the prime minister had been saying, no, we can't do it. We can't attack until we have American permission. And he gives this very vivid description of how uh, uh, Mayor Amit the head of Mossad, comes back into the room at midnight and they're all, it's the sort of high command is sitting around and this being an Israeli meeting, the air is thick with cigarette smoke and so, and Amit walks back in, they say, well, what is it, you know, is it war or no war, will they let us go? And Amit says, well, I've been given to understand, the Americans have told me that they would bless us if we crushed NASA. So they said, that's it. And they started the war on Monday morning and he'd been to Washington and he'd seen Richard Helms, the head of the CIA and a few, very few other very senior officials, and also including, um, certainly, James Jesus Angleton, and they got permission to do it. So that was something that had never been in English. I mean, it really, you, you know, once you've read that, you understand that things are a bit different from the sort of kind of histories you read in English. Where do you two live now? Washington. And where do you two work besides doing books like this now? Well, we have uh, lead a busy life. Um, we make programs for uh, ABC News. Um, I made uh, two pro programs, big programs during the Gulf War for them, a uh, big hour on Cambodia. Uh, and together we make uh, films for PBS Frontline and have for, for some years now. But you operate as outside consultants in this case or outside producers, not on the payroll every day of these organizations? Oh, absolutely. I was on the payroll of one of the big networks for years, uh, CBS News. 
and found that if you're on the payroll all the time, then you can't do anything else. And because we like to go back and forth between films and, and books, uh, also we like to go back and forth between two different, you know, PBS and ABC or one of the networks are quite different. How do you get Coburn out of Cockburn? It was some idea that happened back in Scotland um, several hundred years ago. I'm not responsible, but, uh, but all Coburns carry this mission through life. Is your name is spelt Cockburn, but you pronounce it Coburn. Um, and there are people who give up the struggle and spe change the spelling to C-O-B-U-R-M, but we regard them as backsliders. Who is Alexander Coburn? He's my brother. Who's older? Uh, he is. And uh, do you have, still have a relationship with him? And, sure. And what's he do for a living now? We don't see him in the Wall Street Journal anymore. Uh, no, he's very nomadic. He, um, basically, Alexander, he's, among his many interests, is uh, collecting classic American cars. And he, I think, now has 12 of them distributed, you know, these are late, the big monsters from the late 50s and early 60s, and he has them distributed around the United States. So he basically, he moves around the U.S. in a sort of great circle route, um, and he has cars everywhere. So he, but he, uh, he lives most of the time actually out west, and he's incredibly busy and incredibly productive. I have a younger brother, too, who spent the war, um, the recent Gulf War in Baghdad. He's the correspondent, he's the Middle East editor for an English newspaper, The Independent. And, uh, your brother was very opinionated and very, very visible, especially when he was in the Wall Street Journal. Does that give you a problem that people automatically ascribe his views to you? Um, not sometimes. I mean, not really. I mean, it's um, uh, he often gets confused with me as well. In other areas. So we've, you know, I, I just get used to it. Um, are you Alexander? No, I'm Andrew, or whatever. It's, and uh, he also gets confused with Patrick, of course, who's um, yeah. m most of the time in the Middle East. So. And how about politics? Do either one of you consider yourself strong political people? I don't. Did you get accused of that, though? Well, look, whenever you're looking into this kind of stuff, whenever you spend your life you know, collecting frequent flyer miles to go to places like uh, Cali, Colombia, and Dahran, Saudi Arabia, and uh, Thailand, and you know, when you're actually going out and finding out stuff, the world doesn't fit into a neat little package. It's always a little different from what people expect it to be. So of course you're always going to get, um, it's always controversial. The truth is controversial. People have trouble sometimes making Leslie out. We were um, talking to a, a master Israeli arms dealer um, called Shapik Shapiro, who um, uh, looks the part too. He wears very expensive dark glasses and silk shirts and smokes big cigars. And seeing talking to him in his very elegant office, opposite the Ministry of Defense in Tel Aviv, and Leslie was explaining what she'd been, you know, he was, we were talking like we're talking now, and Leslie was saying, oh, I've done this and done that, and, and, and Shapik took the cigar out of him and said, oh, I see, you're a spy. <laughs> <laughs> it's happened more than once. But uh, there was another, uh, again, a master uh, Israeli uh, intelligence operative who uh, we were uh, in Manhattan, it was late at night, we were in a hotel room grilling this guy for information. And he said, uh, he turned to us and he said, you're Shin Bet, which is, you know, the domestic Israeli intelligence. So um, it's, as I say, it's always more confusing than it seems. One other thing, uh, uh, another quick question. Uh, how many times have each of you been to Israel? Who? Uh, you list a whole bunch here, like yeah. 81, 82, 83, 84, like every year. Is that both of you go, you, go, you travel together? Sometimes together, sometimes separately. Yeah. Uh, We've, we've been for different things. Uh, we did a big, uh, we did an hour for Frontline uh, about what, three years ago. Yeah. That where we traveled several times together. That was four or five times for me at least. Yeah. yeah. When they see you coming into the country, do they do anything special like trail you? Oh, no. I feel very comfortable working there. I mean, as I say, I was there during the, the Gulf War um, under the Scuds and had absolutely no problem at all. In fact, I broke the story about the Patriots misfiring. Uh, it was very interesting because, you know, in a situation like that, it's, it's pretty scary, and most people whipped on their gas masks and went into their sealed rooms. But, of course, you can't see anything in a sealed room, and there's no telephone. It's, you know, you're completely in the dark. You may as well be in Washington. So we set up on the 14th floor balcony of the Tel Aviv Hilton, where we got a brilliant view of what was going on and then could rush down and, you know, go see what the damage was. But one night, uh, four patriots, uh, there was a battery very close to us, the Patriots. And the first one flew up and exploded in midair. The second two flew so low over Tel Aviv that they were going under some of the larger apartment blocks. And the fourth took off, 
went up and did a hairpin turn and came down in front of us. And I said, that's it. And I got on the phone to New York and said, this is really a very bad situation because, you know, you, you, the population of Tel Aviv was suddenly in a position of not only have scuds, having scuds raining down on them, but patriots too. So, um, I was just saying, uh, the question of being, being trailed in Israel. Um, Israel's, if you're, if you're not Palestinian at least, um, it's quite an easy, easy country to get into. The, the interrogate on the way out is when they talk to you. Um, at the, you know, as in most airports, they want to do a security check and sort of see if you haven't got a bomb in your baggage. But that, they also, they'll give you a prolonged interrogation as to where you've been, want to see your hotel room, want to know who you've talked to. I mean, it's, um, and as, as international flights tend to leave Israel at four o'clock in the morning, I mean, you're, you, so you've gotten up at two, or not gone to bed, or uh, groggy, and then suddenly remember sort of, you know, the interrogators, everyone you've talked to in the last month is, uh, can be quite a trying experience. You tell the story about a group from Philadelphia, mm -hmm. the group of Philadelphia Jews, I believe, right, making yeah. the pilgrimage to Israel, and then you also, at one point, talk about being one of you or the other, maybe both of you together, were with uh, Eric Sharon, uh, traveling I near was. near the uh, Green Line of the West Bank and being able to... What I'm getting at here is there was some cynicism coming through all this about what the Israelis do about American Jews coming to Israel on the pilgrimage. Who wants to tell that? Well, the and the Golan <coughs> Heights trip and, and Rob, Mr. Rabin coming in with his helicopter and landing and all that, if I remember it correctly. Yeah, there is cynicism. Um, and it's very interesting because, frankly, uh, you have a situation where American Jews come over and they're donors. Um, I mean, I had the experience of being with a group of, of very big donors. And uh, we went up to a, a spot in the West Bank overlooking what's called the Coastal Plain. Bec I was with Ariel Sharon. And he was making the point to them of how dangerous it was to give up the West Bank because, of course, then you could have uh, uh, missiles flying in from Jordan and, you know, could hit Tel Aviv, whatever. Anyway, so, so he gave a very good demonstration. He had the charts. Everyone was listening. Then they all got back up on the bus. And he turned to me and he said, uh, don't you love it here? Isn't it a beautiful spot for a summer house? It, you have to understand that, I mean, obviously, Sharon takes security seriously. I mean, this guy is a, is a general and has been involved in numerous wars in, in Israel. However, um, he's Israeli and uh, there is a sense of we're here and you're not. You know, you live in New York or you live in Philadelphia. We're here. Uh, there, there's also a very, there's, a, there's a, a certain snobbism that we talk about as well. Um, there is a, a group in Tel Aviv who are regarded as, or they're called wasps. Um, and what wasps mean, it's not the same connotation, but, but it's uh, what, um, white Ashkenazi sabras with protexia, which means that um, you, know, you, you were born in Israel and you've got the right connections. You're from the ruling class. Yeah. Uh, go back to the, the group from Philadelphia. Um, what is the tour? When, someone, when an American Jew comes to Israel and they're donors, where do they take them? Well, um, there are a number of set routes, but the tour we talk about here is a sort of a security tour where they're taken to see, like the one Leslie described, uh, you know, the spot on the Green Line where to show um, you know, how vulnerable Israel is. Or what, what is the Green Line? The Green Line is the old border with the West Bank. Um, it's, you know, now it's uh, <coughs> a notional. It's, it's, it's the border of the, of the West Bank from Israel proper. So we're taken to places like that, to Masada, maybe. Um, What's we, Masada? Masada is oh, it's a very interesting place. It's a, it's this fortress, or it's a, a rock rising out of the desert um, in the south, and it's on the top of the sort of ruins that have been excavated in the last few years. It's where the last Jewish um, rebels against the Romans held out in AD until in AD seventy. And the Romans built these enormous ramps to, to you know, a tremendous amount of effort to get sort of siege engines up this sheer rock to uh, to take the place. And just before the Romans broke in, they all committed suicide. So this is, you know, for very recently, it's a very sort of holy spot to for uh, for Israelis. Um, Masada and to the Golan Heights, for example, which again is very vivid to if you want to sort of convey a sense of Israeli vulnerability. You say, when well, the Golan Heights before 67, the Syrians were up here looking down on Israel, 
and they could shell us and indeed did and you know attack settlers and so forth. And we describe in the book the, um, the scene where the, the, all these um, Philadelphians uh, arrived um, to, uh, to witness an, an Israeli army firepower demonstration. And we really tell it through the eyes of an Israeli who was watching. Um, it was a, a correspondent for Haaretz, big paper. Um, because uh, he reacted to it. He said, this is ludicrous. How demeaning for us that we have to put on this circus for all these, for these Americans um, who don't understand us. And they, uh, you know, and he, he describes, this, he basically describes these, these Israeli soldiers having to perform like seals just for the gratification of the American donors in order to sort of wait for the handout. And he said it's very demeaning for Israelis to have to sort of do this. I mean, it's a very sort of cynical piece he does wrote. The, does the handout come eventually? No. Oh, well, yeah, the handout, the overall handout, of course, well, for one reason or another is, you know, many billions of dollars a year. Um, and although the private donations aren't as, as big as the um, U.S. taxpayer donations, uh, they're still very large, uh, Israel bonds or direct contributions. Um, so that's something the Israelis pay a great deal of attention to. Who was it? Was it the former defense minister, Rabin, that came in in the helicopter? Yes, in, at this far, in, the, in the Golan, the, um, in the middle of it all, uh, uh, there's an announcer, it's like at a fairground, there was an announcer, crackling announcements in English. And this was supposed to be, they were saying, well, we're showing you the Israeli army in training, except all the signs were um, sort of in English, which would be odd since you know, Israelis speak Hebrew, and all the commands that were issued were in English too, which is again odd for a real demonstration. In the middle of all this, you know, putt, 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 and in comes the helicopter with Itzhak Rabin, um, who makes a, made a stirring speech, and everyone presented medals and awards to each other, and then the, uh, the IDF, the Israeli army, went on to attack the quote-unquote Syrians, which was a pile of barrels, and blew them all apart. And I guess the what I want to ask you is, that, uh, do you think that this group of leaders uh, meaning everybody in the intelligence community, in the military, and in the government, are sitting behind the scenes laughing at the Americans coming over giving the money? Is this a no, that's much too strong. Uh, the, the, the reason why we put that anecdote in the beginning of the book about the demonstration that wasn't a real demonstration uh, was, you know, it, th that's one side of Israel. But we immediately asked people to take a tour down this street that Andrew mentioned before, Shal Hamalek, next to the, uh, the Ministry of Defense, um, which is the real, uh, the, the real Israel for but this security to, system. But they didn't they, take the Philadelphians down the street where the Defense Ministry is located. No, and they don't get to spend time with uh, these kinds of people, absolutely not. Why not? Because this is a world, of, first of all, because, uh, you know, if, you, if you're not in the business in some way, or a or, you know, meddlesome journalist like us, why go there? Um, you know, I mean, they, they would have nothing in common. They would have nothing to discuss. You know, these are very uh, tough, seasoned operators we're talking about here. And uh, they can't be bothered with, you know, seeing a tour group, unless they happen to be a politician. I asked you earlier whether or not the Israelis lie about what they're doing, and I want to ask you the same question about the American government. You catch the American government in a lie when you're covering them about things like arms and drugs. And oh, sure, I mean the uh, the American government. Um, I mean, there's a number of lies on the record. I mean, it's continu of continuing embarrassment. Um, I mean, the, the great one of the great lies of the '80s was, the, for instance, that we weren't selling arms to Iran. Well, we were. We were doing it through our Israeli proxy. And in fact, as we reveal in the book. Um, the, um, we were doing it from day one of the Reagan administration. We have a, uh, someone we spoke to actually on the record, a General Avraham Tamir, who was like the sort of Brent Scowcroft, sort of shadowy backroom back figure, you know, uh, advisor, high level advisor to these ready governments um, through the 1980s. I mean, he told us how Al Hay gave them permission to, um, uh, to sell arms to Iran from day one of the administration. He also described to us, again, a lie. I mean, the, the, it was the lie that, uh, that we weren't involved in any way in the Israeli invasion of Lebanon. He described how he and Eric Sharon came to Washington in the spring of 1982 to get the green light to invade Lebanon. And, you know, he lays it all out and he explains why Haig wanted them to do it. And, uh, he said, uh, he said, Haig sort of said, uh, 
OK, we want a minor operation. And then Tamir went like this. And he said, it's a big word, minor. I mean, because they never did this huge war. American government lie? Oh, of course, all the time. Um, I think, uh, I, I mean, you know, we saw it in spades in the 80s, uh, particularly w what we know of now is Iran-Contra. But interestingly enough, uh, in, as part of that, on the Central America side of things, for example, um, we were not given a, a very good picture of what Israel's involvement was in Central America during that war. In fact, what we reveal in the book, I mean, not only did you have an operation like uh, Tipped Kettle, where William Casey turned to the Israelis and said, we want a, you know, hundreds of tons of weapons for the Contras, which he did, which they delivered. Uh, you had Israeli advisors running around Honduras as early as 1981. You had one of the guys on the Contra directorate would go regularly brief the Israeli consul in Tegucigalpa in Honduras about how the war was going. Uh, in Panama, uh, Manuel Noriega, I mean, no one wants to touch him anymore, but he was certainly great friends with uh, people in the White House and in the agency uh, in, as part of the whole Contra effort. And at his right hand was Mike Harari, known as Mad Mike in Panama, who was former chief of clandestine operations for Mossad for Israeli intelligence. This was Noriega's business partner. This was a guy who imported half a billion dollars worth of Israeli arms into Panama and was uh, intimately involved with the secret side of the operations of, of training uh, and supplying the Contras that were coming out of Panama. Where did you get all the intricate knowledge that you have of the Mike Harari departure from uh, Panama on that night of the invasion? Well, that's interesting because that comes from, uh, that's piecing to, you know, there were, there were a few very good journalists there at the time, uh, Americans. Um, the Hebrew press has some excellent, I mean, there are people over there who really tried to track that down because they were very interested to see Mike Harari suddenly back in Tel Aviv at a time when the U.S. military controlled the ground, the air, all exit points. This guy suddenly disappears. And also the Panamanians have come out, you know, the guy who became the, the chief of staff of the Panamanian military um, said that the U.S. officials told him to stay away from Harari. Not to ask questions, just stay away from it. You say he got out in a C-130? Well, we don't know exactly how he got out. We think he did, yeah. We Look, think he did. We think who's C-130? Well, I think there's only one country that has C-130s in the net, that neighborhood, and that's the United States. But we don't actually know how he left the country, how he left Panama. But he left at a time when he shouldn't have been able to get out. Where is he now? Back in his uh, house, um, I think well, he's still building his new house in Tel Aviv, right? Yes, that's right. Um, and, he, and Mike Harari was involved originally in the Olympic massacre? Well, he wasn't involved in the massacre. I mean, the so, after right, hunt? Right. He, he was in charge of a hit squad that was set up uh, by Mossad to go around, personally ordered by the then Israeli Prime Minister, Golda Meir, to go around uh, uh, assassinated, killing the, you know, the Palestinians who had been involved in the Munich, the massacre at the Munich Olympics in 1972. And it all came to, um, they had some success, and then it all sort of crashed to earth when they went off to Norway, he and his team, to, um, to deal with a guy they was known as the Red Prince, a very sort of important Palestinian. Um, and uh, they, so that was their man, and they got ready, and then they killed him, and it turned out to be a poor Moroccan waiter. It was just... Uh, when you find out things... Uh that are new and different and revealing about governments that lie. Do you get mad or do you get excited when you find it out? In other words, what's, what's your personal reaction? No, I don't get mad. I get very excited. Um, I got very excited while we were working on this book when we got a hold of some documents that uh, a lot of FBI files and others that had been secret, uh, which were released under Freedom of Information, about the cover-up of a, a, a series of White Houses administrations of uh, Israeli nuclear espionage in the United States and sitting there poring over those documents, reading uh, uh, accounts of White House meetings, uh, reading memos from, for example, uh, when Nixon came into, the into office, the second thing he asked J. Edgar Hoover to do for him was get me the files on Israeli nuclear espionage. And likewise, the Johnson administration, uh, when he, uh, CIA Director DeKalm's brief Johnson 
on what was going on with the Israeli nuclear program, Johnson said, don't tell anybody, not even Roscoe McNamara, who were, of course, his two very senior people. Um, so that kind of, you know, being able to find out, getting a glimpse of what's happening in the real world, what's happening on the inside is, is do you, great. Do you get mad or do you... Do you uh Get yes. excited. Uh, sometimes I must say the sort of enormity of some some crime uh, takes my breath away, and I, you know, I think, God, yes, I do get indignant sometimes. But I like Leslie, and I think like most journalists, uh, you know, I think when you actually find out or figure out, ah, that's what they were up to. That's um, you know, that it's a great sort of surge of excitement you get when you have that feeling. Here's who the book is dedicated to: Chloe and Olivia. Who is it? Our who are they? How old are they? Seven and twelve. They typed that dedication themselves. They wanted to make sure it got in. They didn't trust us to do it, so they went up to the typewriter and did How it. How did you both have time to have two children in the middle of all this running around? Well, uh, when I was pregnant with the first one, I was, uh, let's see, when I was eight months pregnant, I think I was working in, uh, on a story in West Africa at the time, in Liberia. Um, when I was pregnant with the second one, I was working in Israel. Uh, I was working in, in various, on various stories. So. Just keep going. What's next? Uh, we're headed back to the Middle East, uh, not to Israel um, right now. Although, since the Israelis are very interested in the book, we probably probably should go there. But um, no, we're going to the uh, um, going to other countries in the Middle East. We're working on another frontline film. And do you want to write another book? Oh, sure. What, what if you had it? If you could do it today, what would you write it about? <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't say. I couldn't say. I mean, there are ideas that are already starting to, to uh, gel for us, but we won't do another one probably for another year. Either of us, I don't think. Yeah, it's pretty. Writing a book is an intense experience, which you don't want to repeat too often. Here's what the book looks like. It's called Dangerous Liaison, the inside story of the U.S.-Israeli covert relationship. And our guests have been co-authors Andrew and Leslie Coburn. Thank you both very much. Thank you. Thank you.